Glad that you are again here, okay? Is the person beside you smiling? Can you check? Yeah? Okay. If not, if not, just say, it's, it's right. It's okay to smile. Tell the person, it's okay to smile. Awesome, awesome. Okay. So anyway, um, our theme for the year is make a difference. Okay? Make a difference. That's what we want to do. Last year, uh, our theme was grow big in a small group. So you can see that over here uh, on my right. That is our theme. And that's something that we still want to continue. But also right now, our theme for this year uh, is make a difference. I want to show you some photos of people who are making a difference in your life and yet you don't even know them. Yeah. These are people who are making a difference in your life, probably, and you don't even know them. For example, the first is uh, Niels. Niels Bolin. Okay? You don't even know him, but he's making a difference in your life. He's the inventor of the oh, he's the inventor of the three-point seat belt that is now standard for all cars. He used to work for Volvo and that is what he was able to uh, to make and invent. Does it help you? You yes. think so? Yes. Yeah, there's an estimate in one research there that at least one million people have been saved because of this invention. Okay. This guy, Maurice Ross. This guy changed your life. Okay. For the men, it has changed your bank account. Probably. <laughs> I'm kidding. Alright. But basically, with this duty-free shopping, he has earned an amount of about $7.5 billion. Okay, $7.5 billion. But his desire and his intention is that his whole fortune of $7.5 billion will be donated within his lifetime. So he has donated right now a total of 62 out of the 7.5, he has already donated it for the improvements in education, science, healthcare, aging, and civil rights. And he has $1.3 billion to go. I intend to ask him for a 1%. No, I'm kidding. But that's his, that, is, that, is, that is his plan. As a matter of fact, that $1.3 billion, he has a plan already to finish it off by 2016. So those are three people that has changed our lives and we don't even know it. I'm not sure if you also know this guy. His name is Samuel Mardzen. He's from England and a church missionary uh, from the Church Missionary Society. And in the 1800s, he went to Australia. And when he was in Australia, he said that there should be a mission trip to New Zealand so that the Bible can be brought to New Zealand, so that Christianity can be brought to New Zealand. Finally, after several years of, lab, um, of lobbying with this church mission, in 1814, the first um, worship service happened in, in uh, Bay of Islands on Christmas Day. So that is the actual spot almost exactly 200 years ago. Okay? We're 2014 now. In 1814, that is the area where they first had their worship service with the Maori people translating the language to their people and 400 people attended this service. And because of his legacy, we have the Bible until today and Christianity actually has spread all throughout New Zealand and now it is our desire that it just you know, grows and becomes more relevant as it was many years ago. So, those are people that are making a difference and you don't even know it. I believe all of us have this innate desire to feel and experience that we are making a difference in other people's lives. As parents, who among you here are parents? Just raise your hand. Parents, you have a big responsibility to make a difference in your children's life. Who among you here are soon to be parents. I just want to raise hands. Soon to be parents. Yes, yes, soon to be parents. Yeah. Who among you here want to be parents? Okay. I'll talk to you and I might convince you and talk you out of it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. What is making a difference? Basically, when you're making a difference, it's going to change someone's life. It might even change history or it might change someone's mindset 
and the effect is long term. If I ask you, who made a difference in your life? Who made a difference in your life? It could be your teacher, maybe. Maybe a pastor changed your life. Maybe a parent changed your life. But I'm sure there are people in your life that has changed you and made you for who you are today. God wants you to make a difference in someone else's life as well. Okay? Sometimes we think, me? Make a difference? I'm not that smart. I'm not that skilled. I, I, I lack these resources. But you know what? Sometimes saying even just one word or even one phrase can change the person's life. Okay? Amen? That is why our theme for the year is to make a difference and we're going to challenge you all throughout the year that you can make a difference wherever God has put you. If I ask you, who among you here are immigrants? You, never, you were not born in New Zealand. Raise your hand. Okay? Many of you. What are you doing in New Zealand? Okay? Sometimes we think it's for um, a career path. Sometimes we think it's for the benefit of our families. And those are noble causes. But perhaps God also wants you to make a difference to where, the job, where your job will be or maybe who your community will be. Let me talk to you about the greatest person who made the greatest difference in my life. And he has been making a difference in the lives of so many people all throughout generations, even when he has passed away already. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the one who made a difference. And that is why I call it, Jesus makes all the difference. And that's what I want to talk about this afternoon. There are four stages in making a difference in your life or in the people around you. But let's look at the pattern of Jesus when he talked to the Samaritan woman at the well. Are we ready to hear this message? Why don't we pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. And we pray, Lord Father God, that we can understand your, uh, this message because your spirit is speaking to us. Yeah. Lord Father God, I, all I know is you wanted me to speak this message. So Lord, I pray that I am simply your instrument and you will speak your very message to each person in this room who made their way to Bayview Primary School to hear this. Lord, let this be not my words, but let this be your words. Prepare our hearts and our minds. Speak to us, O oh God, and may we apply this message in our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you go. To, please go to John chapter 4. We'll be there most of the time. At the same time, I will put it on screen. But if you have your Bibles, you can uh, open your Bibles. Sometimes I ask, I tell you guys, open your Bibles. But nowadays, I think I should update myself and say, click your Bibles. Okay? <laughs> In the first stage of, of making a difference, and this is what Jesus did, it's called initiate. Everyone say initiate. In John chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, it says, Now he had, got, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sikar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Okay? So Jesus went through Samaria. Now sometimes we read this and we think, okay, so that's not really a memory verse, but what does it really mean? Jews traveling to some uh, Jews traveling from Judea all the way up, okay, will to will all, all the way up will usually take the long route. They don't want to go through Samaria. Okay, if you're gonna show the map, okay. So from Judea, if they want to go up to Galilee. They would rather take the long way instead of going through Samaria. Why? Because during, the, during many uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of years ago, the, Israel, the country Israel was separated into the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom was uh, attacked and was invaded by the Assyrians. And when the Assyrians won, what the Assyrians did is they brought the Assyrians to the area of Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom that time. So there was intermarriage going on in Samaria. But for the Jews, that was no way. No way. We don't want to intermarry. Okay? It's like 
intermarrying with foreigners is like a betrayal for your people and a betrayal for your country. So there was a hatred, but uh, there was a hatred happening between the Jews and the Samaritans. And yet, what did Jesus do? Jesus went through Samaria. Okay? So making a difference would mean that you would go to places you would rather avoid. Making a difference would mean that you have to you have to break cultural barriers. You have to break traditional barriers, social barriers, gender barriers, and racial barriers if you want to make a difference. And Jesus took initiative to reach out to that person in Samaria. And today, I believe Jesus has taken the initiative to reach out to you as well. God continues to reach out to people until today. I don't know. Why are you here? Okay? Why are you here? Okay. May I ask you, why are you here? Did someone invite you? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Did, why, so why, when, why did you say yes? Did, did, did the friend who, invite you, who invited you say, because there's food after. No. There's lechon and roast beef. <laughs> well, I don't know what your motives are. Why you are here. Or were you dragged here? Were you, how, were, how, was it, how were you convinced? But today, Jesus is, I'm telling you, Jesus today is seeking you out. Perhaps it is not an accident that you have a friend who attends CCF, that you were invited, that you came, that your schedule was fixed, that your health is enough to be able to come here. Okay? Or probably you're here because you ran out of excuses. Whatever it is, I believe God is reaching out to you. I still remember... I know someone from CCF many years back. His son started attending Bible studies of CCF. And the son invited the father, Dad, attend, let's go and see, attend these Bible studies in CCF. And the father was furious. He said, why are you attending those Bible studies? Okay? I will not even allow you to attend these Bible studies. And then he even said, I will never attend your Bible studies. That's what the father said. Well, the son continued to pray, and eventually the son was allowed to go to the Bible studies, but the father was still very hard-hearted, and he said, I will never attend your Bible studies. And one time, his son invite, asked him again, Dad, would you like to go to a Bible study? And the father said, Why? Why do you keep on inviting me? And then the son said, It was because of these Bible studies that I stopped taking drugs. And his father was surprised. And you know what the father did next? He attended the Bible studies. And as he continued to attend these Bible studies, he grew, he grew, and he realized that it's not a religion, but a personal relationship with Christ that matters to him. And so he received Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. He continued to grow. And later on, that, that father, who was against Bible studies, was starting to invite others to the Bible study. More than that, as he continued to grow and read the Word and understand what the Word is and how it's applied in our daily lives, it continued to grow, he continued to grow, and you know what happened? He started teaching Bible studies. And later on, he has been very influential in helping us making big decisions in our church back in the Philippines. God is reaching out to many of us today. And sometimes we think, maybe God has forgotten me. No, I believe the fact that you are here, God has something for you to hear. We have about nine or ten D-group leaders. Some of them are couples. Okay? Uh, and these D-group leaders, when you ask them, did you immediately say yes when you were invited to a Bible study? Did you immediately pray to receive Christ into your heart when, when the gospel was shared to you? And many, if not most of them, will say, No, I refused. I said I had all these excuses as well. You know what? God is reaching out to us. And we thank God that He's persistent because He wants us to have a personal relationship with Him. Let's look at verse 6. It says there, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the Jordan, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Of all the places in Samaria, 
Jesus decides to stay near the well. You know what? Later on, you'll find out a Samaritan woman would be coming. Do you think it was an accident? I don't think so. I consider this a divine appointment by God, wanting to reach out to the Samaritan woman. He exerted effort. What time of the day was it? It was noon. Okay? So let's look at verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Okay? It was the woman's role to get water for the family. And usually, they do it in the morning or towards the evening so that it won't be too hot. So what would happen is in the morning, a lot of women will be lining up to get some water and they'll probably be talking, they'll be chatting, talking about where's the next duty-free gonna open, okay, I don't know. And later on in the evening, they will also talk and probably see each other at the well and that's where people talk. And even maybe gossip, I don't know. This woman, it's already strange that she went to the well at noon. Was it because she was trying to avoid people? Was it possibly because she knew that she had a bad reputation and she didn't want others to be there around her? That's why she went during lunchtime, during noon? Well, there's one thing for sure. When it comes to Jesus, He reaches out to all kinds of people. Sometimes we think Jesus only likes those people who are nice, those who give money to the church, those who are friendly. But if you will look at the Gospels, Jesus reached out to the outcasts. You understand? Jesus would reach out to the outcasts. And the Samaritan woman is, is just like that. For some of us, we might be thinking, well, you know what? I've been so far from God. I don't even know anymore if I believe in God. Or maybe there are times in our lives we have blamed God for the things that are happening in our lives. Can I tell you, God will still want to reach out to you, no matter what situation you are in right now. You do not wait for you to change and become better, then you go to God. You first go to God, and then He helps you change for the better. Amen? Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for you to get your act together. He acted already to reach out to you. He initiated. Now, when it comes to going out of His way, I know this friend of mine, okay, when in his younger years, okay, he liked girls. Okay. Where, where are the teenagers here? Can I just raise your hand? Can I see how many teenagers are here? Okay. Those who are old, don't raise your hand. I know your age. Okay, yeah. So a few teenagers here. Now, I have this friend of mine. Okay. So all throughout his teenage years, he had several girlfriends in and out of relationships. There was even a time that he had two girlfriends at the same time. I can see the, the ladies, their hair is like standing up already. Who's this guy? Let's kill it. Okay. okay. There was even a time he had two dates in one night to date those two girlfriends. Oh, kill him now. Okay. But one day, he finally surrendered his life to Christ. He realized his mistakes. He asked for forgiveness. And he was transformed. You know what he did? He went so much way out of his way. And I don't, uh, at that time, yeah, cell phones was already common. But he decided to look for all his ex-girlfriends. He tried to contact all his ex-girlfriends just so that he can go to them and ask for forgiveness. And by God's grace, he was able to talk to all his ex-girlfriends and he was able to um, ask for forgiveness from each one of them. Okay? 
So he's still alive, so that means they didn't kill him yet. <laughs> oh, yet. Okay. Is God telling you to initiate something? Is God telling you to go out of your way to reach out to someone? Well, that's what it takes to make a difference. And we can copy <coughs> Jesus because he went out of his way to reach out to each and every one of us. Some of us, there are some relationships that needs to be repaired. Some relationships that are strained right now. And God is telling you, initiate, reach out to that person. It doesn't matter anymore what that person's reaction will be. But what you are able to do is to do your part. Second is inquire. First you initiate, then inquire. Well, actually, for when you come, when I say inquire, if you want to make a difference, you inquire and find out, okay, what the situation is, so that you will know how to help. For Jesus, it's kind of different because he does not need to inquire. He already knows everything, right? So in John chapter four, as we continue the story, it says, Jesus answered her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Okay? What is he saying here? The woman went to the well to satisfy physical thirst. And yet Jesus is trying to redirect her. That, is, that there is something more important, more long-lasting, more eternal, than just physical thirst. And that is the, the thirst that our souls have. We have a God-shaped vacuum in our souls that only God can fill. And God is telling us, I can fill it. There is something more important than just the physical. How does this apply in our lives? For many of us who are probably immigrants, or any one of us who are probably living here in New Zealand, we are preoccupied a lot with uh, being able to fill our physical needs. Perhaps you are, you know, you, we plan, or you plan your career. You plan how to use your money. You plan your children's future. Okay? You plan how to go about it so that you, have, you can have permanent residency status here. And that's all right to plan. But have you been doing something and thinking about the spiritual aspect of your life? Sometimes we are so preoccupied with just the physical, we are forgetting that we also need to nourish the soul. It says here, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, he would, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. So what is that gift? A gift is something that you are given freely, right? Have you ever paid for a gift given to you? It's like, here's a gift, and here's the receipt, okay? Or, I, I've made some boo-boos already, and I, I, I was so like um, embarrassed when I, I've given some gifts to people, and the price tag and the receipt were still inside the gift wrapper. Have you experienced this? Oh my gosh, so it's like, I was, they, so they find out about the price and I had to tell them, no, no, it's, it's, it's a gift, right? So it's a gift. So when it's a gift, it means you don't earn it, okay, because it is given to you. The gift that Romans chapter 6, 23 is saying is this, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? It says here, the gift is eternal life. Life forever in heaven. That is the gift of God. And where is it found? In Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we have Christ Jesus our Lord, we also have the gift of eternal life. Okay? Why can't we earn it? Sometimes we think, we think, okay, for me to go to heaven, I need to earn it. I earn it by doing more good works than bad. I try to give more money to the poor than into my vices. So it's like you're thinking that you earn it. But the gift of eternal life cannot be earned because we cannot afford it. The precious gift of eternal life is so precious that it had to take the blood of Jesus Christ to pay for the penalty of our sins. No amount of good works can, can fill that. 
so that you can afford eternal life. That's why Jesus had to pay for it so that you don't have to pay for it. And all you have to do when it comes to a gift is to receive it. In verse 13, it says, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. And whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus' concern today is more than just your physical, but for your spiritual. But God was also concerned for your whole being. God says, I will provide for all your needs. That's physical. Do we need shelter? Yes. Yeah? Do we need food? Yes. Do we need drinks? Yes. Do we need lechon? Yes. <laughs> Later, we need lechon. Okay. What am I saying here? God promises that He will provide for all your physical needs. It just depends how do you define need. Sometimes you say, I need an iPhone 6. I need the John. I need. You need to find out what are our real needs. If you actually think about it, there are only a few needs in, the, in life. And God promises to provide for your needs. But he's talking here as well of our spiritual needs that we should not be forgetting. Some of us might be feeling empty. Some of us might be feeling that there is no purpose in your life right now. Some of us might be thinking there seems to be an emptiness. After I go out with my friends, I have, after I go to a party, when I go home, all the, all the happiness is left at the door and there's emptiness in my soul. Well, that is not a unique situation. Many people are experiencing some emptiness right now. And it could be people in this room. And God wants it to be filled with living water, which is Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God is saying there is no other way. It is a narrow way to go to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. Sometimes we try to fill our needs with things. Sometimes we try to fill our... I know someone. I know someone. When she's, dis, she's depressed and she's discouraged, she goes on a shopping spree. Yes. Do you know people like that? Don't look at your wife. Okay? Okay? My wife does this. I allow her to go on a shopping spree but only in the dollar shop. <laughs> some, <laughs> some people try to fill the void in their lives with relationships. Like my friend who tried to fill the void with different girlfriends at the same time. Gosh. Okay? Some people try to fill it by going to the office and going up the ladder to feel good about themselves. And God is saying, only I can fill your needs for all eternity. Do you know Jim Carrey? Jim Carrey, I, I saw that there's a, I don't know if he's a Christian, maybe not, but this is one of his quotes. He said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. This woman had physical needs, that's why she went to the well. But Jesus is telling her there's also some spiritual needs. I will meet your physical needs, I will meet your spiritual needs, but there's also another need that I am going to fill for you. So in verse 15, in verse 15 it says, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she desired this living water and she still thinks it's just to fill her physical thirst. So Jesus inquired a little bit more. Not that she didn't know the answer, but was trying to draw out from the woman herself what the answer is. So what did Jesus answer? He said, okay. You want this living water? He told her, Go, call your husband and, call, and come back. I have no husband, she said. 
Jesus said to her, You are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So this woman was married how many times? Five times. I don't know. Anyone beat that record here? Don't. Just one, okay? Married five times, and he's with a sixth man. I'm not totally sure why she had five husbands. But it's most probably because she, she was divorced. The man divorced her. During that time, man, the man can actually make any excuse just to easily divorce the wife. Or maybe some of those, one of those five, two of those five, okay, um, passed away. But whatever it is, having five husbands and going to the sixth man means that there is an emptiness in her. And there is some emo emotional pain that she is carrying. There are some emotional scars. And probably sometime during the nights, she would wake up because she would still remember all the pain that she had from those past five husbands. Sometimes, maybe she's working, or maybe while walking, going to the well, she's re she remembers the pain and experiences that she's had with those in the past. And Jesus is saying, even for your emotional needs, I am here to heal you. In a room like this, I am not surprised that there are people here who are hurting. There are people here who are confused. There are people here who might not know really what is their purpose in life. Maybe it's an incident or a situation that happened just last week, or last month, or last year, or many years back, and yet you still feel the pain of the words that were said to you. Someone once said, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Is that true? Sometimes words are more painful because when you are hurt physically, later on, it gets healed. But there are some emotional wounds that take such a longer time to be healed. And yet Jesus is saying here, I also want to heal you and fill you. For some of us, maybe we've lost hope already. Maybe you've even doubted the goodness of God. Can I tell you, don't lose hope. Admit your need and let Jesus fill your need. Making a difference means you are meeting the needs of people, not just physical, but also emotional, and even pointing them to Christ for their spiritual needs. When I talk to people in CCF, they have, their own con they have their concerns as well. It doesn't mean that just because you're in a church, your problems disappear. If some church or some pastor tells you, you come to our church and all your problems will disappear, yeah, run away from that church and disappear from him because that is not true. When I talk to CCF friends, some of you, you're still waiting for that job that will eventually give you permanent residency. For some of you, you're even just looking for a job right now. Some of you, you have uncertainties here in New Zealand. Some of you also have family concerns. And I encourage you, you give it up to God. And let Him give Him the opportunity to work in your life and to prove to you that He is alive and He is the God who heals you. Amen? Amen. I heard of this story. It's called The Tale of Three Trees. Okay? The Tale of Three Trees. They were in a mountaintop, and the tree, there were three trees talking to each other. Now, for your info, trees don't talk to each other. It's a tale. Okay? The first tree said, okay, I want to be cut down and made into a treasure chest that will be able to hold valuable treasures. I want to be a treasure chest. 
the second tree said, well, for me, I want them to cut me down and make me into a mighty boat that will be able to travel to many seas and carry kings all around. The third tree said, I don't want to be cut. I just want to be here standing so that when people see me as a tree, they think of God. They remember God. So after a few years, some woodcutters went and they saw the tree. The first woodcutter cut the tree and the first tree said, yes, I will now be made into a treasure chest. And then the second woodcutter cut the second tree and then said, yes, I will now be a mighty boat carrying kings. And then the third tree was trying not to look. I don't want to be cut. I don't want to be cut. But the third woodcutter cut the tree, the third tree. And they were, put, they were brought down to the, from the mountain. The first tree was brought to a, to a carpenter shop. And she's now excited. I'm going to be a treasure chest, treasure chest, treasure chest. Singing along the way. Trees don't sing. And so does Ryan. He doesn't sing. Okay? But he realized he was not being made into a treasure chest. He was simply being made into a, a, a food container for animals. And instead of treasure, hay was put on him. And it was put in a different place. The second tree was brought to the shipyard. And in that shipyard, he was excited to be made into a mighty ship. But instead, he was made into a simple fisherman's boat. The third tree, wondering what would happen to him, just said, okay, I've been cut down. Okay? And he said they were cut. He was cut into beams and was left in a storage place. For many years, their dreams have been shattered. What's our purpose anymore? We have lost our purpose no more. But one day, in that feeding, in the first tree, a father and a mother with a newborn child said, there's no place around. I couldn't even make a cut. But here, here's a food container. Here's a manger. And let's put our baby here. And the first tree realized, wow. I'm holding the greatest treasure in all of the universe. And the second tree was in the ship, was, was in the sea. And there was a tired man who went and a few other people, and the tired man slept. And, in, and during that time, it was calm, and then suddenly a raging sea, the raging uh, storm came. And the second tree was scared. Oh, I cannot handle this pressure. And then, they woke up, the, the, the man was sleeping, and the man just stood up and said, be still. And everything was still. And the second tree realized that he was carrying the king of kings. The third tree was surprised when suddenly the beams were cut from him and were cut and someone had to carry him up a mountain. And up in the mountain, he felt that there were nails and hands being hit upon him and he was being stuck. And those beams were being made into a cross. And later that cross was put up with a man dying there. And he realized, wow, when now when people look at me, they remember God. On the third day, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead to prove to us that we can also have eternal life. And when we still remember that cross, we still remember God, even 2,000 years after. I am not sure what you are going through today. If you are thinking that you have lost purpose, if there were some things in your life that you feel have destroyed your future, can I encourage you? God can work it out so that whatever your past is or whatever your present is, God can still work it out for the best future that He has for you. And you can make a difference. 
Amen? Amen. Thirdly, you influence. You influence. After you inquire, you influence. It says, Sir, verse 19, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman didn't answer directly, but now she understands that it is the spiritual issues that are more important to Jesus. Okay? And now she desires to worship. And of course, for people to be able to worship in a temple, they have to make some sacrifices, they have to make some uh, they have to cleanse theirself, themselves, and they have to confess their sins. So now the woman is realizing, I don't want to worship. I want to worship, but I have to cleanse myself. So that's where the woman is right now. And, he was, and the woman was now asking, okay, so do I go to a temple? Do I go to Jerusalem to be able to worship? So verse 23, it says here, Jesus answered, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worship is, true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for these are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Jesus explains to her more. If you really want to worship God, it is not in a place. Okay? It, is, it is us worshiping with our spirits, honoring the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, wherever that may be. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now the woman is getting more understanding. From a man who was simply at the well, to someone who said, oh, you're probably a prophet. You know, what's you know what my past is. And now he's, he's thinking, is this the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus clearly, can it be any clearer than that? Okay, it says, that Jesus declared, I, the, the one speaking to you, I am he. That is why Jesus cannot simply be a good teacher. You cannot say, oh, who is Jesus? Oh, he's a good teacher. He cannot simply be a good teacher. Because he is declaring that he is God and he wants to be worshipped. So if he is truly God, you have to worship him. But if he is not God, and he is declaring that he is God, then he is of the devil. There is no middle ground. Either Jesus Christ is God, or he is of the devil, but there is no middle ground. He is now influencing this person, this woman. You make that decision. But this is what the Bible says. This is what the scriptures say. I am the one. I am the Messiah. You cannot stay on the middle ground and just wait. Oh, yeah, he's a nice teacher. I like his stories. I like the parables. Oh, it was cute that he was able to raise someone from the dead. That is not enough. You need to find out for yourself and decide. Is he the king of kings that you will worship? Or is he simply uh, of the devil? And you have to make that decision. I ask you, what is holding you back to finally decide and declare, Okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you all the way. I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. You ask yourselves, what is holding you back? Is it, is it your, your own beliefs? It is, your, is it your convictions? Is it even your family? Is it religion? Whatever it is, you have to give it up if you really want and desire to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I have this friend. Okay, he's a prince. Can you believe I know a friend? I have a friend who is a prince. Okay? His name is Prince Saha. Saha Madan from, Ma from Nepal. He's from the royal caste. A Hindu. Okay? He never experienced problems with money. One time, with this money, he traveled to the USA and spent the money along the way. And he stopped over in the Philippines to do, you know, to spend money in the Philippines. And it was in the Philippines that he ran out of money. Okay? This guy, this prince ran out of money. Okay? Okay? He had no food. And he had no money. And he was already crying for a week. He decided to contact the Nepalese embassy in the Philippines. And they were able to talk. And there he met a Christian. And that, that Nepalese Christian shared the gospel to him. He understood it, not completely, because remember, this is a Hindu. Hindus have 
about 33 million gods. Okay? So, they have about 33 million gods. And what was being taught here with the gospel is there's only one God, Jesus Christ. But he prayed to receive Christ. And that Nepalese Christian attends CCF. So they would bring, he would bring Prince Sa to CCF. And that's where I met him. And for a few months, he stayed. He grew spiritually. He attended even Bible classes and Bible studies. You know? And he found out how, uh, and he found out what it is to be a true Christian. That you need to surrender everything and follow God. And he knew the consequences. So finally, uh, the, the family sent him money and he was able to go back to Nepal. The family saw changes in his life. Okay? Prince As' life was changed and his family saw. So when the family asked, what changed with you? And then he said, I am now a Christ follower. I am now a Christian. And his family was so furious. His family was so angry, okay? And they fought about it, and then they even said, okay, I will, we will provide, the family will provide everything you need. We will give you more money, we will give you house, we will give you a business, okay? As long as you leave Jesus. What did he decide? Well, for him, he knew what it means to surrender his life to Christ and give his whole heart to Christ. And he said, I'm not going to give up Jesus. I have surrendered my life to him. So for the longest time, they were, fa they were fighting. Eventually, the relationship got healed a bit. Okay? He left, he served God, he married a pastor's wife. Okay? No, that's wrong. <laughs> that's polygamy. <laughs> Married a pastor's daughter. Okay. Start from the beginning. I know this prince. Okay, just kidding. Married pastor's daughter. And he helped his father-in-law build the church. And for a while, they had a youth group numbering to 250 people. He set up five Christian schools for the poor with about 550 students. And he was sharing the gospel wherever. He was reaching out to the tribes. Eventually, his parents did accept him back. But he knew that he was not going to give up Jesus Christ because he has surrendered his life to him. What is holding you back from completely saying, okay, Lord, I'm all yours. Lead my life beginning today. Take all my pain. Take all my uncertainties. Take all my anxiety. Later on, as I close in prayer, I will give you that opportunity today. Lastly, after you influence, you are able to inspire. You are able to inspire people to do the same. Look at the woman. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Can you imagine? She left her jar. The very purpose for the day was to go at noon, bring that jar, fill it with water, and bring it back to the family or to whoever. But she left her jar because she realized there was something more important than simply that physical need. Her purpose in life changed and she couldn't contain herself that she shared it to others. Her faith grew little by little throughout the conversation. Again, to a man that he just met in the well, surprised that a man was even talking to him. And then later on, thinking he's a prophet, but now probably thinking a messiah, and now passing it on and telling others about him. I don't know how close you are with God. For some of you, you probably don't even believe in God. For some of you, you know a little about him. You heard about him in school and with friends, but that's it. For some of you, you've probably been taught a lot 
about who God is growing up. Okay? For some of you, you, do, you have already surrendered your life to Christ, and yet you have strayed away. But whatever place you are in right now, whether really far from God or really close to God, God gives you the opportunity with open arms to me. Get closer to me. Get closer to me. I don't know what are you depending on, but here are some unreliable authorities when we make decisions. First is culture. Well, everyone's doing it, so that might be what's right. Number two is tradition. Well, we're always doing it this way or that way, so it has to be right. Number three is reason. It seems logical, therefore maybe it's right. Or four, your authority is emotion. If it feels right, then it must be right. Well, there's only one thing that is right, and that is the Bible. That is the Bible. And all I'm going to do is share the Bible for the rest of my life. Lord, verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became the <laughs> Okay. It's the lechon's fault. I'm kidding. Anyway, um, before we go, why don't we just pray again? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us this place. Because we would not have... Um, we would not fit if we were in the community center. But we thank you, Lord, that we're here together. I know, Lord, for a fact, that you are speaking to some of us right now. So I just pray, Lord Father God, right now, that as I just finish up this message, you will allow us, Lord Father God, to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if I ask you, for the woman, become the just go back, Micah. For the woman, she left her jar. Her main purpose was to go and fill her jar. But she forgot it. She left it. Because she realized that there was something of more value than just what her jar is. Okay? For some of us, we might be holding a jar that we are not wanting to give up. And God is saying, hey, surrender it to me and let me fill you with living water that will last for all eternity. You know, we got distracted there, but let not the spirit that is speaking to you right now uh, not be quenched. And for others, they got inspired as well. Okay, if you look at verse 40, what happened? So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days, and because of his many words, many more became believers. Jesus makes all the difference. And he made the difference with this one woman, a Samaritan at that, probably hiding her reputation, probably trying to forget her past. And now, she's the one who is making a difference in that community. Whatever, how, no matter how broken you are, I'm telling you, God can repair that. And God can actually use whatever you've gone through to help others along the way. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Who is Jesus Christ to you? There is no middle ground. I close with this story. About 30 years ago, there's this man, maybe 50 years old at that time, probably, and he got cancer. And this man, in the, in the hospital bed, was visited by Peter Tanji. And in that hospital bed, they prayed, and then they decided, hey, do you want to have Bible studies once you get out of this hospital? Trying to cheer him up, I guess. And yeah, true enough, in spite of all his cancer, when the doctors opened the man for surgery, all the cancer cells seemed to be all compiled in one place. And they were able to take out all of the cancer. So he had a successful surgery. And after that, yep, they had Bible studies. They had Bible studies. 
he, he invited uh, Peter, Pastor Peter, to go to his house. Let's have Bible studies. And Pastor Peter knew a few others in that um, subdivision. So they all went to his Bible study. Okay? And that, in that Bible study, they started inviting friends. And more people came. This was around 1979. And when more people came, they decided, hey, I think God is telling us to start a church. This cancer survivor opened his house for the first Bible studies of Christ Commission Fellowship. And I can show you some photos. That's the man. And if you will see, well, you won't see, but at the back is the table where they first had CCF Bible studies. Can I show the other picture? Yep. It's that same table that they had their first Bible studies 30 years ago. And now CCF is worldwide and it's growing, but please. It's not about the name of CCF. It's about making the name of Jesus Christ famous. This man, this man is the same man who first talked to Pastor Peter and said, Hey, Ryan and Lay are interested and are planning to start CCF New Zealand. He was the first man who talked to Pastor Peter about it. And Pastor Peter said, okay, then let's talk to Ryan. But I seem, it, I seem to agree to that plan. So when I finally called Pastor Peter, Pastor Peter, this is my plan. Before I could even finish my sentence, Pastor Peter being Pastor Peter said, So Ryan, you want my blessing to start CCF New Zealand? You have my blessing. Oh, what else? <laughs> you know, it's time is, you know, decides fast. That's why we're here today, two years after that conversation. Well, Lolo Ike just passed away 11 days ago at age 86. Lays, lays her granddaughter. For eight years, she, he prayed every day for Lay to become a Christian. And after eight years, finally, Lay surrendered her life to Christ and became a sold-out Christian. So I thank Lolo Ike, not just for being able to uh, start CCF through his conversations, but also to prepare my wife, my future wife. So it's very personal to me. He's passed away, but he has helped start CCF. And for some of you, you might know, he also helped pioneer GCF, Green Hills Christian Fellowship. But you, you won't see him as a pastor being on stage all the time. He works in the background. Okay? And he's a part of the senior adults ministry, Glorious Hope, different ministries. But it doesn't matter for him whether he's standing on stage teaching or no one knows him. Because for him, what's important is that people know Jesus Christ, not Lord Life. And today, he's passed away. And yet, the impact of him making a difference lives on. That's the beauty of making a difference. Sometimes we'll never know how much impact we've done. And we'll only find out in heaven. And for some of us, God is not telling you to impact the world. But God is telling you to impact that just one person who is in your family, that one family member, or maybe that one person in the office, or one person, that one classmate of yours in school. That is what God is telling you to do. But now, it starts with this. Jesus Christ makes all the difference. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have made all the difference in the world. You have really transformed so many people. And 
that cannot be denied. Even if some people will deny your deity. If we look at the facts, it's not a lack of facts, but just a lack of wanting to believe the facts. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone here. I guess it is not an accident that we are all here. It's not an accident that this is the message you strongly impressed upon me with, with um, Pastor Nathan's consent. Lord, I know, Lord Father God, that you wanted this message to be heard by the people here. Father, allow us to make a difference. Even if they'll never know our names, they will know that we made a difference in their lives. For some people here, Lord, they want Jesus in their lives. They want Jesus to make a difference in their lives. I pray, Lord Father God, right now, that you allow them to open their hearts to you. But that is a decision they have to make. For those of you who really want to open their lives to Christ and surrender their lives to Christ, I give you this opportunity right now. And it starts with a prayer asking Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. And if that is your prayer and desire, to make Jesus your Savior and Lord, then you can just repeat after me. But let the words that you say really be meant from your hearts. Dear God, I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I've made mistakes. I admit that that I've had a bad past. I now believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all my sins. That He paid everything that needs to be paid so that I don't need to pay anything anymore. And all I have to do is to receive that free gift of eternal life. I now open the door of my heart. I ask you to come into my life. I now surrender my life to you. I give to you all my pains. I give to you all my ambitions. I give to you all my concerns. I give it to you. And I ask you to lead my life beginning today. I commit myself to you, Lord. Help me grow in this newfound relationship with you. For some of us here, you want to make a difference. You want to really be used by God to make a difference to the people around you. I want to pray for you. If that is you, you want to make a difference, I want you to raise your hand. You're going to say, Lord, I'm going to make a difference. Yep, I see your hands. I see you at the back. Can I pray for you right now? Lord, Father, God, Thank you for these hands that were raised high. Maybe they've gone through a lot, but Lord, they're saying, in spite of the uncertainties, uncert uh, in spite of all the hardships, in spite of all the uncert um, all the concerns, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a difference. Lord, I pray for them, Lord, that you will just use them mightily more than they ever thought possible. And Lord, we pray that as a church, we will make a difference wherever you have placed us. Work, family, school, <coughs> and even in this church, and in this community, baby. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We give you all the glory. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.